Now that we've covered the mid-latitude cyclone and all the fronts that go along with it, time to talk about some of the more out there weather, the severe weather. Now, mid-latitude cyclones they happen all the time. Warm fronts, cold fronts, stationary fronts, occluded fronts. You find them on weather maps pretty much every day. Now, severe weather only happens occasionally, luckily, because, like the name implies, it's a kind of a serious thing. Now, thunderstorms are a type of severe weather, and the worst thunderstorms can give us things like huge hail storms and tornadoes. Um, but, you know, typical wimpy thunderstorms you might not categorize as severe, but it's, it's still a thing. And then you have hurricanes. Those are the two we're going to worry about are uh, severe thunderstorms that can lead to tornadoes and hurricanes. Not to say those are the only things. There are other types of wind gusts and such, but it's just not in the realm of what we're covering. All right, so uh, a thunderstorm, your typical thunderstorm uh, that we get around here most of the time. Nine out of ten are not that big a deal, but they usually happen along a cold front. It, it can happen along a warm front uh, as long as there's a big difference in uh, temperature between the two air masses that are colliding. This is what you're going to have. You need the big temperature difference because you need rapidly rising uh, warm air. The rapidly rising warm air is what's going to provide the energy and the moisture to make this interesting. So it starts, or it's made up of, uh, individual convection cells. If you remember convection, that was when warm material rose and cool material sunk. Well, in a thunderstorm, that's what we have happening. We have warm air rising, and as it cools off, it eventually sinks back down again. So we have our convection cells. And you get your rapidly rising warm moist air. As the air rises, it cools to the dew point. Once it reaches the dew point, if you have condensation nuclei and saturated air, which the dew point tells you it is, then droplets can start to form. Now, when it goes from a vapor back to being a liquid droplet or solid ice crystal, if that's the case, it releases energy. Now, when it releases energy, that warms up the air. So the warm air that was rising gets even warmer again, and it rises even more. And it releases more energy and it rises more and it gets into this cycle where it keeps building and building and building as long as you're providing more energy by way of condensation or sublimation the storm can keep growing so if you have enough moisture and if conditions are right this is what can lead to a severe thunderstorm uh, it could lead to high winds heavy precipitation and uh, lightning worst case scenario lightning happens because you end up with a charge difference between the top of the cloud and the bottom of the cloud and the ground for that matter, there's different types of lightning. Uh, often in the cloud it happens because of ice crystals bumping into each other, uh, sort of like rubbing your feet on the carpet can build up electrons so you can zap people, um, smack in uh, raindrops and ice crystals especially against each other can lead to that static buildup and you can end up with lightning as a result. So it starts off as just a poofy little cloud, nothing special, but warm air is rising. As the warm air rises up, it's going to cool. Uh, eventually, it's going to hit the dew point, and that's the height where clouds start to form at is when it hits the dew point. Now, if the warm air keeps rising, which it more than likely will, uh, the cloud keeps growing and growing and growing. As we see with the red arrows, it can get above the freezing point even in the summertime. However, eventually it does get to the point where it's not, it's out of water, it's not going to release any more energy to speak of, and that warm air starts to fall. So in front of the storm you'll have a cold downdraft. So the red is an updraft air going up, the blue is a downdraft air, air and water droplets falling out. If you think about thunderstorms that you've probably experienced, um, before it starts to rain or right as it starts to rain you often get a big blast of wind which really signals for you to say uh oh i should get out of here uh, and that happens because of the falling raindrops in the cloud the falling cold air in the cloud and that can lead to a big blast of wind in front of these storms uh, maybe five years ago or so out on pillar point there was uh, a big wind storm that happened a microburst is what they call them and uh, they can push out in front of the thunderstorm quite a long way and give you hurricane force winds at least for a brief time in a straight line so they can be a serious thing too now eventually the warm air stops coming in uh, to the system 
and this cell will fall apart. You'll have no more warm air going up into it, but cold air falling down out of it. But the thing is, as this front moves along the ground, it's always running into it. So that particular cell might be done, but new cells are forming. So thunderstorm lines can go across states. It doesn't have to just die out when that one cell does. Now, the biggest thunderstorms, like the picture that just popped in there, uh, can give you what's called an anvil-shaped top. They get really flat on top. It looks almost like a nuclear bomb blast, in all honesty, but you can see underneath it, there's mountains and stuff off in the distance, and then all of a sudden they disappear. That's where it's raining, and then the mountains pick up again. So this is just one huge convection cell. I don't think I'd want to be underneath that one necessarily. Now, those big thunderstorms are so tall, they literally bump into the stratosphere. The whole troposphere is full of that cloud. It hits the next layer up. That's why they get flat on top. And even in the hottest part of the summer, it's freezing cold up there five, six, seven miles. So those raindrops often freeze together and can form uh, your big hailstones. Now, most hailstones do not get as big as this, but the one in the top uh, left picture that measured around it there, you see one foot seven inches. That's not too much different around than say a volleyball. I mean, this was a big hailstone falling out. And even smaller ones, golf ball size stones and such, if you get hit by those going 60 or 70 plus miles an hour falling out of a, a thunderstorm, that is going to really ruin your day. Uh, storm chasers wear helmets when they're trying to collect them. And you can see the damage done to these cars. It just is beat to death where all the hailstones hit the metal panels and left dimples everywhere. Blew out the windows. There's, there's a really nice one. Um, again, way bigger than softball size in that case. Now... If the storm is strong enough, you can have rotation in the cloud from the rising air um, that gets it swirling in a horizontal direction. And since it's moving across the ground, there's friction with the bottom and not so much up higher, it often will tip. And that horizontal rotation can get tipped and turn into vertical, and that's what a, a tornado is. Now this picture here shows the path where a tornado went. You can see the lighter colored section down through the image where my arrows go in there. That's where a tornado went through and literally even pulled the grass up. So it looks lighter colored because you see bare dirt. Uh, you see roofs off to the left where my arrow is all the way down through there, roofs off to the right. But down the middle, there's nothing because the tornado just destroyed everything in its path. Of all the forces of nature, Tornadoes are probably the strongest, uh, at least as far as weather goes. You can have winds in excess of 300 miles an hour, and very little is going to withstand that. Now, overall, they're small, though. That's the only saving grace here is the whole path of that storm wasn't much more than a few football fields wide. So if you were a block over in the neighborhood, you're, you're fine. Your trash can might have tipped over. You go down five or six houses, and all of a sudden, your neighbor doesn't have a house anymore, or a car, or you probably don't have a neighbor either, so it's not a good deal. Um, tornadoes are small but very intense, where hurricanes are much bigger and dangerous for other reasons. So speaking of things, now, where can tornadoes happen? The United States, of all the countries in the world, the United States wins this contest. We have more tornadoes in our country than any other country by far. Uh, our section of North America is just right where we have cold air coming down out of Canada, warm, wet air coming up out of the Gulf of Mexico, and where those two drastically different pieces of air run into each other, perfect conditions for tornadoes and severe weather. So you can see uh, it's called the Tornado Alley across through the middle of the country here. Uh, it's just where you have the two very dramatically different air masses hitting each other. Now, we can have them in New York. There's a handful of them every year, though ours are typically weaker because we have a little rougher terrain uh, or a little further north, so the temperature difference tends to not be as dramatic, but we can have them. Most of Florida's happen because they get uh, hurricanes coming in, and the hurricanes lead to strong thunderstorms, which then spawn tornadoes, so one thing leads to the other. Uh, but just the normal tornadoes that happen, not related to hurricanes spawning them, you're going to go from Texas all the way across to Indiana easily, up into Nebraska and the Dakotas, even into Canada. We're not the only ones who can get them. 
but we just tend to have more than anybody else. About the safest place is Alaska, and even they have an occasional one, but it's very rare because they're so far north. So yeah, here you can see the distribution of tornadoes. Australia does pretty good along their coast because they have quite a few uh, cyclones that come in too, hurricanes that come in along the eastern coast of Australia. Europe gets a few, but it's pretty mountainous. So we we win. USA, USA. I, I don't know if this is something we want to win at, but we do. So uh, here's a cross section of kind of how the thunderstorm cloud looks. And tornadoes usually form on the back of it. So this whole thing is moving uh, towards the right. And tornadoes are usually behind it, which can be, depending on where you are, certainly, certainly dangerous. So if you're over here, and this is coming towards you, you might have light rain, some heavy rain, but it's really hard to see because it's windy and rainy. So you don't even know that there's a tornado coming at you until it's literally right on top of you because you can't see it through all of the, the, the rain and wind and hail potentially back there. Um, when, if you've ever watched different storm chaser shows or things about tornadoes, they try to catch up to these storms from behind. So they're in the clear part behind it. It's a lot safer. I mean, it's still a dangerous thing to do, but sneaking up from behind the tornado, you can at least see it if it forms. If you're out in front of it and it's coming towards you, uh, it can all of a sudden be on top of you and you can't get out of the way. It was just a few years ago that one of the more prominent uh, tornado chasers actually got caught up in one of these and it lost his life. So it's, it's a dangerous hobby. So uh, they have that flat top where they've literally hit the stratosphere. Occasionally they'll poke through a little bit, but that falls back down. And uh, that's the general scenario. <clears throat> so you're not gonna have to know how, like every little detail about the development of tornadoes, but it's an interesting topic. It's certainly something that deserves more study so we can give more warning to people who are affected by them. And some pretty pictures. <clears throat> Excuse me. So there's different types of them. There's a stovepipe one where it's a nice straight cylinder. This one's kind of a twisting, roping, like you swing a rope around, they call it a rope tornado. You can have multiple ones, you have multiple vortexes where they're going around each other and interfering interfering with each other, influencing each other. They're pretty much, well, this one's not clear, but you can see the cloud coming down. They don't really become super evident until they start to pick up debris and dust and dirt. That's when they tend to get really dark and more visible. Now, damage related to, uh, here's some pictures from FEMA. They go in after the fact and try and assess the damage and whatnot. And uh, you can see, it's kind of serious stuff. So a couple of full-size pickup trucks that are not full-size anymore. Fixer upper house. Uh, it's got a good foundation. Everything else needs a little work. My favorite pictures, the fork stuck in a tree down here in the lower left. So imagine the house in the upper right-hand corner gets just destroyed by this uh, tornado going through. Well, everything that's in the house all of a sudden just became shrapnel. So the silverware drawer, knives, forks, your couch, your dog, your cat, you, you're all swirling around at hundreds of miles an hour. And the fork hit the tree so hard that it stuck in almost all the tines and bent. That just blows my mind that it's going so fast. Here's a piece of sheet metal off a roof. Almost cut the tree in half. So that's what's so dangerous. I mean, if it just picked you up, that'd be one thing. But all this debris swirling around inside there just shreds you. So dangerous situation. And in recent years, they've been kind of strong and been known to affect uh, towns. Here's one, I think it was Greensburg, uh, went right across the town, like perfect width. It was like a mile wide town, mile wide tornado, went through and just destroyed it. Virtually everything, I think it was like 90% or plus, more than 90% of the buildings were just utterly gone. Uh, even the trees get all their limbs ripped off and there's just a, a trunk standing afterwards. There you go. So you can see little stubs of trees sticking up, virtually no homes. That's a grain silo, so they're they're ludicrously strong. So that did okay, but not much else. So you have spinning air due to the updraft and different speeds um, in the cloud ends up tipping and coming down. The, in all honesty, we don't fully 100% understand or can't predict when they're going to form. We know what conditions are right for them, but we're 
meteorologists are really working hard to try and be able to predict it further out in advance. They're up to about 20 minutes warning in most cases where they can warn communities 20 minutes ahead of time that a tornado might be coming, but sometimes that's not enough. So we'd like to be able to predict it further out just to save lives. All right, now hurricane. Hurricanes are very limited in where they can form. They have to form over the ocean. They have to form near the equator, but not on the equator. Typically they form between like 10 degrees either side of the equator and like 25 degrees. The ocean waters have to be at least between 80 and 90 degrees. It has to be really warm ocean water for these to happen, to have enough energy available. A hurricane is just a low pressure system, so a cyclone that we've already talked about. But when they form over the ocean, there's almost an unlimited amount of energy available over that warm water because of the the energy, the moisture going up into the storm. So first it's called, well, first it's a tropical depression. Then it's a tropical storm from uh, about 35 to 74 miles an hour. It's a tropical storm. Once it hits 75, then it's classified as a hurricane. Hurricanes for the United States tend to come, most of them at least, come from the coast of Africa, form over the Atlantic Ocean, work across in that range, like I said, between 10 and 25 or so north. They go uh, from the east to the west because at that latitude, the winds push them that direction. And as long as they're over open water with no other storms influencing them and the water's warm enough, they can grow and get stronger and stronger. There's a limited time of the year where these can form because the water's not always warm enough. So typically in the summer months. Once they get to higher latitudes, they usually curve back to the east. You'll see that here in a second. So from above, there's a nice hurricane. Now this is a very well-developed one. You can see the swirling pattern. They're low pressure, so they go counterclockwise and the winds go in toward the center. The cold air sinks in the center of it, so they often, but not always, have an eye in the center of the hurricane where cold air is sinking. It's pretty calm there, uh, at least for the brief time it's over you. It's the, the eye of the storm is the calm part of it. So the energy that makes a hurricane possible, the fuel for a hurricane, is condensation. You have to have water vapor going into the storm. You have to have condensation happening on a big scale to release energy, which heats up the air, which causes more air to get sucked in, to cause it to rise, and it has to build and grow and keep, keep doing this in order to create a, a hurricane, a super low pressure system. So condensation causes higher temperatures, higher temperatures cause a bigger pressure difference, a bigger pressure difference causes stronger winds, stronger winds create more evaporation, and more evaporation brings more water into the storm, and it just keeps building and snowballing, so to speak, though you wouldn't have snow here because it's really warm. So uh, one thing leads to another and it just keeps keeps growing. As long as it is over open ocean water and no other storms are messing with it, hurricanes will grow. The bigger the space, the more the time, potentially the stronger it can be. So this was the 2017 hurricane season. This actually, I probably ought to get the data for the 2021 and pop this in here one of these days. 2020 was a record setting year where we had more hurricanes than any other year on record. Prior to that, I think it was 2005 or six, that was the record. Um, but as oceans get warmer due to global warming, we expect to see more and more hurricanes and stronger hurricanes because there's more energy available. So they mainly start off the coast of Africa here, low pressures come off, they build strength, and some years they seem to like to go into the Gulf of Mexico, kind of across the Yucatan Peninsula. Other years they will curve off the coast of Florida, maybe not hit land, and, and scoop back out into the colder waters of the North Atlantic. Some, sometimes they don't do anything, they just come off the coast of Africa, kind of doodle around here in the middle, and then fall apart because other storm systems made them unstable. Now, we're not the only ones that get them. We tend to be focused on ourselves, but they can form on the west side of S Central America here. 
and very rarely scoop back up into us, just not the way it works. They tend to head out into the ocean, maybe more towards Hawaii. Uh, the Asian continent, Japan, Indonesia, and, and such, they do have uh, potentially very, even stronger hurricanes than us because it's a bigger ocean for them to build over. Uh, so they can make landfall over here. Australia gets a few. That's like I said, where the tornadoes often spawn or when these guys come ashore. But it's all guided by the planetary winds pushing them around. And we're going to talk more about planetary winds in the next topic. Well, this one gets real busy. But there's from 1851 in the Atlantic and 1949 in the Pacific, all of the, the hurricane paths laid on top of each other. It gets really busy, but you can see uh, a lot of them form. I don't know what the average is. Uh, lately, we've been pushing 20, but some years it's two or three. So uh, say we average 10 a year, probably not extraordinarily out of the realm of possibility. So anywhere on the East Coast, you could potentially see it. We are luckily far enough inland where we can get some thunderstorms from it and certainly some rain from it, but we're not going to get hurricane force winds or any direct impact. That, that hangs out pretty near the shoreline. Now, the biggest cause of death and the biggest cause of destruction, everybody would think, would be the winds from a hurricane. And winds are a big deal, but often the storm surge is a bigger problem. Uh, the areas these are coming on shore uh, are usually pretty low-lying. And as the air is rising up into the storm forming the hurricane, it creates very low pressure in the middle. And just like if you, you know, put your lips on a straw and suck, it, it brings the liquid up because you created low pressure when you did that. When you have a lower pressure over the ocean surface, it actually causes the ocean surface to bulge up. In the strongest of hurricanes, we could be talking 10, 15 feet, maybe even more than that, of bulge of water under it. So when the storm comes on shore, it brings that bulge of water on shore with it. And if you were having strong winds, so you're getting 20 foot, 30 foot waves anyways, plus this bulge of water, maybe it happens at high tide, so it's already higher too, you can end up with 20, 30, 40 extra feet of water potentially in these areas that aren't that high above sea level. And so you end up with massive flooding and loss of life and damage to property due to the flooding. So it's often the storm surge that gets you. Once a hurricane goes on shore, it's toast. Uh, hurricanes need the condensation of water vapor. There's just not enough of it on land. Going across a little lake or little river is not going to cut it. So a hurricane's going to weaken when it comes on shore, or if it goes to colder water where it can't evaporate enough fast enough. So hurricanes are low pressure systems that go counterclockwise and inward toward the center. The eye is where it all gets to, and then eventually that cold air has to sink somewhere. So you end up with a cloudless central downdraft where you have cool air uh, sinking down in there. So it's actually nice weather in the eye if, if it's there, at least for a short time. And once it comes on shore, loses its water, uh, it's done for. If it goes to higher latitudes, it loses the warmth and the energy, it's done for. Um, they can also, for being as big and powerful as they are, they're also kind of fragile. So if another front or another storm system runs into it, it can push it over and that messes with the whole flow and that can cause them to weaken as well. So yeah, there's the storm surge right there. So the water gets sucked up underneath it and you have winds pushing on top of that. So you can end up with this big bulge of water which comes on shore. So it piles up and can lead to crazy amounts of flooding, especially northeast of the storm. So there are different categories. Um, most of the ones, luckily, are, are weak when they come on shore, especially when they get closer, they get affected by the fact that the land is there. But I mean, anything over 157 is a category five. And we're talking storm surge 20 plus feet, and the waves on top of that. Um, so, if you're in it, I don't know if you care what category it is. It's scary and it's potentially deadly, but there are five categories if you're into that. So here's New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina pretty much buried it. Uh, 
New Orleans is below sea level to start with. Levees broke, so the whole, a large portion of the city flooded, as you can see in the picture down there. Um, so that, that's what I said. The, the flooding can be a bigger problem than the winds and longer lasting. Where's the water going to go? All right, so I think we'll stop there. Uh, so now we've covered all the fronts, all the pressure systems, severe weather. Now it's just a matter of reviewing, doing the worksheet on severe weather, and we'll be having a test here in a, in a few days on weather systems. All right, thanks for watching. Have a good day.